Modeling in simulation is great, as this allows scientists or engineers to visualize the real world on a simulation without using nor experimenting with real world objects. This saves them time and money when it comes to making up new stuff for people to enjoy. They may rely on physical replicas most of the time, but a lot of them relies on the mathematical model of the object. These are certain formulas or function that represents the idea of the object. This allows the scientist to modify said model by changing values instead of remodeling it from scratch. So by changing the value of x or y to another number, it is a whole new different dimension of the same model. There are a lot of mathematical equations that can be used to describe the system, phenomenon, or anything in this world, including Earth of course. But how accurate are they on describing said object? Are they reliable enough for us to trust our entire project solely on mathematical models? That is the question we're trying to prove in this subject and that is what we're tackling for today's lesson. This is all about introduction to numerical and symbolic computation. So what we're going to do is just to give you an idea on what will be our subjects for numerical and symbolic computations and give you some examples on how a mathematical model can be inaccurate enough for our project and how can we remedy it. Before anything else, this subject is all about numerical analysis. This refers to the analysis of mathematical problems by numerical means, especially mathematical problems arising from models based on calculus. So as I've mentioned, there are three types of models that we can use for simulation. We have physical model that is a replica of the object that we're trying to experiment on. We have a logical model that is the flowchart or the graphical model that we can use for, again, modeling. And of course, we have mathematical. So mathematical are based on calculus and they are functions and equations that represent a certain object. So let's say, for example, a model of a car. So a model of a car can be modeled mathematically using um, its shape, the suspension on the car, and whatnot. So anything inside the car can be modeled using mathematical model. But there's a problem. Not all mathematical equations are exactly the same as the real world. And that is what we're going to tackle today. What are these problems that can be encountered when we're using models based on calculus? So in order for us to use an effective numerical analysis, we require several things. The first one is an understanding of the computational tool being used, be it a calculator or a computer. Because as I've mentioned, we can use computers for this, but they are not that exact. So when we say we can use pi on a computer, not every number inside the pi is inside that. We may use 3.14 or we may use 3.1416 or the computer can only go up to 100 decimal points. Although that is enough for us, it's not enough to justify the pi or the number that we're trying to use. So there are limitations on our computers and calculators itself, so we must understand that limitation. Next is an understanding of the problem to be solved. Again, there are certain equations that we can use to identify whether our model is exactly the same as the real world. And that is what we're trying to solve. Now, if we understand it fully, we can recreate the model or we can recreate the function and the equation itself for it to be accurate enough for the problem. And finally, the construction of an algorithm which will solve the given mathematical problem to a given desired accuracy and within the limits of the resources available. So it can be time, memory, or anything else. So right after we created the model that we wanted and we understand the limitations of the computer or the calculator that we're going to use, we can now create an algorithm based on our limitations itself. So if our computer can only handle 1 million numbers, let's say for example, we can modify our algorithm based on the million numbers that we have on our computer. Or if our problem can only have at least 4 decimal points, the algorithm itself must only contain at least 4 decimal points and nothing else. So those are how we can use numerical analysis effectively. 
So numerical analysis is actually a complex undertaking. It is an actual job. It's not just a subject that we're going to teach in this semester and then you can forget about it. It's actually a job. And people, or number of people, that make this their life's work. Usually working on only a limited variety of mathematical problems. So there are a lot of mathematical problems that arise inside our society. And some people are only dedicated on some mathematical problems, not all of them. Let's say, for example, a problem when it comes to census. There are people that are dedicated only for the census, but they are not dedicated on other experimental factors like hunger and whatnot. So this is a complex undertaking. Most of our time will be taken up with looking at algorithms for solving basic problems such as root finding and numerical integration, but we will also look at the structure of computers and the implications of using them in numerical calculations. As I've mentioned, we're going to relate this on the course that you have, which is computer science. And since we're going to use computers most of the time on our laboratories and whatnot, all of the problems that we will be guided with are within the bound of computers. So what are the limitations of our computers, how fast the computer can solve this uh, problem within its time frame, so on and so forth. We're going to tackle that later on our laboratory itself. But for now, let's look at the relationship of numerical analysis to the larger world of science and engineering. So let's talk about science and numerical analysis. How does science affect numerical analysis and vice versa? So traditionally, engineering and science had two-sided approach to understanding the subject, the theoretical and experimental. So when you have a theory, let's say for example, you theorize that the apple will fall on the speed. So if you have that theory, go ahead and go to experimental, wherein you're going to experiment whether your assumptions or your theory is correct. That is our traditional. But most recently, a third approach has become equally important, the computational. So why do we have computational science nowadays? This is due to the fact that not every theory can be experimented with. There are some limitations on experimentation when it comes to theorizing. So let's say for example, we theorize that a car will crash on this number of speed. We can't use a real car with real people to drive it. That's why we're going to compute it using computational science instead. So traditionally, we would build an understanding by building theoretical mathematical models and we would solve these problems for special cases. So let's say, for example, we want to know how porous this liquid is. There are some equations that we can use or build to study how a fluid can pass a spear. This experiment is mostly used to obtain some idea on the nature of the fluid that we're trying to use. So let's say, for example, gasoline. How incompressible erosional fluid is it? So we're going to pass it to a spear. We also use this experimental approach to obtain better information about the flow of practical fluids. Most of the time, we first create a theoretical mathematical model, then we test it later on. But more practical situations could be seldom handled by direct means because the needed equations were too difficult to solve. There are some equations on the theoretical mathematical side that is commonly really hard to justify, even using calculators and such. So it needs some type of computation for it for us to understand the model. Most of the time, we don't want to use mathematical models before because there are no means for us to solve these mathematical equations on time. Rather, just putting a spear inside the liquid and then letting it flow. So that was the easiest part before. The theory would suggest ideas to be tried in the laboratory, and the experimental results would often suggest directions for a further development of the theory. So before, because it is hard for us to understand mathematical models, the theory would suggest a better alternative and just go to the laboratory and test it on your own. That was before computers were actually involved in the study of theoretical mathematics. But now, with the rapid advance in powerful computers, we can now augment the study of fluid flow by directly solving the theoretical models of the fluid flow as applied to practical solutions. This area is often referred to as computational fluid dynamics. At the heart of computational science is numerical analysis, and to effectively carry out a computational science approach to studying a physical problem, we must understand the numerical analysis being used, especially if improvements are to be made to the computational techniques being used. 
So just like in the picture, we can create a model inside a computer instead. So augmentation means creating a 3D model. But you may be asking yourself, Sir, that is already in 3D modeling and we're talking about mathematics. How is mathematics related to 3D modeling? So every 3D model that you have on a computer is actually computed within itself. The range, the height, the width, and whatnot. So everything inside that is actually computed by the computer. And we have to make it as accurate as possible. And the only way for us to make it accurate is to create an equation. So for us to gain some more understanding when it comes to the numerical analysis part of mathematical models, let's take a look on mathematical models that we can use as an example. So how accurate these models have in order for it to represent the real thing. So as mentioned, a mathematical model is a mathematical description of a physical situation. We're trying to represent a system, an entity, a phenomenon, or anything in the world using mathematical description. By means of studying the model, we hope to understand more about the physical situation. Any mathematical model that we can use must describe the real thing or must describe the physical situation. So let's start with a very simple model. So our model is area is equals to 4 pi r squared. So it's actually a very basic equation that represents a surface area of a sphere. But there's a catch. I included letter E on the radius. E means Earth. So this formula is now the surface area of the Earth. Now let's ask how accurate is this formula on representing the Earth itself? So we need pi. That's 3.1416 or whatever. You can use the entire pi if you want to. But we need to get the radius itself. So the known radius of the Earth is actually 6,000. The known radius of the Earth is 6,371 kilometers. So that is for the surface area of the Earth. But here's the thing, there are two radius that we can use on computing the surface of the Earth. We have the equator radius, which is 6,378 kilometers. And we have the polar radius, which is 6,357 kilometers. So how did I know this? Um, again, Google, you can look at the Earth's radius on Wikipedia or on Quora. So we have that. And if you're going to check out, these radius are actually really different from each other. So the Earth is not a complete sphere. It's actually somewhat of an oblong. And here's the catch. There are craters on Earth. There are mountains. The sea itself is a huge crater filled with water if we can consider it like that. So the Earth is not a complete sphere. Therefore, this equation doesn't represent the Earth accurately. We also have other models that we can discuss. So you may not be familiar with this equation, but this is the logistics model. The logistics model is a simple model for population growth. So we have NT right here. This denotes the number of individuals in a population. So the number of individual can be a bacteria, an animal, people, or whatnot. It depends on what you're trying to observe. And the constant C right here is the growth constant. And it usually be determined empirically. Over short periods of time, this is often an accurate model for population growth. Because C is growth constant. That means whenever they take that census of a certain population, that number will never change for a short period of time. Let's say for example, we're observing animals. Those animals may reproduce whenever they want or they may die in the process. Whenever that happens, the growth constant changes and it is unknown until we get to the census again. So the logistic model is accurate at a certain point of time but not always. Another population problem that we can use is the lotka volterra model. So for those of you who are not familiar with lotka volterra model, this is the predator-prey model. So the predator and prey model is a simple observation in the environment where there are two species. The one is a predator, the one is a prey, wherein the predators hunt the preys. 
the prey's population decreases. As the prey decreases, more and more predators will starve to death. Then the prey population rises again. Then the remaining predators attack them again. So it's a continuous cycle of hunting and dying. That is Lot Cavaltera model. So let f of t denote the number of foxes at a time. So that's right here. Let r of t denote the number of rabbits at a time. That's right here. And let a, b, c, d denote the positive constants. So these positive constants describe the interaction of the two species. So a, b, c, and d are the interaction of the two species. Whether the predator hunt the prey, the predator starve to death, the population of the prey increases, so on and so forth. Those are the interaction of the two species. So in some cases, this is a very useful model and agrees with the physical experiments because this is the nature of the world. There are predators and preys at large. But the model will fail, however, when there are other populations that affect the first two populations in a significant way. So let's say, for example, the predator has another predator or there are two predators that hunts the prey. Or maybe there are viruses or bacteria that affects the prey entirely. Maybe they will decrease before being hunted by the predators themselves. Or there are some viruses or bacteria that affects the predator's side. They may die before they hunt the prey instead. So there are a lot of factors that can affect the predator-prey model. So this model does not accurately represent the wilderness. So as we've mentioned, mathematical models has its limits. Solving a bad model will not give good results, no matter how accurately it is solved. The person solving this model and using its result must know enough about the formation of the model to be able to correctly interpret the numerical results. So the person, the scientist, the engineer, or the researcher that uses these models must know the limitations that has taken place whenever using these formula. So the limitation may be the computer, may be the environment itself, or the limitation may be the system itself. So those limitations must be taken place in order for them to say whether the answer is accurate or not. And that will be the lesson that we'll be tackling later on on our subject. And that concludes our lesson for today. If you have questions, you can leave them on the comment section on our Google Classroom. You can also leave a message on one of my socials that is right here. And you can also reach me on our Facebook group. But again, that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching this video. Have a great day.